Ripley. Cunning. Merciless. Time Warner presents Predators of the Wild. Six collectible volumes of compelling wildlife action. From the ocean's deep to the plains of the Serengeti, the vicious struggle for survival is unending, and the difference between hunter and hunted could depend on the size of an appetite at any given time. Restless sharks, savage lions, killer whales. Get an uncensored and unflinching view of the stunning tactics that make them nature's most efficient hunters. Wild dogs, giant grizzlies, exotic cats. Time Warner presents Predators of the Wild, a revealing look at how nature's true hunters teach their young to survive in an untamed wilderness. Beautifully photographed in some of the world's most exotic locales, Predators is a breathtaking look at nature's savage beasts. Collect all six volumes, including the ocean's most terrifying predator, Shark. Get up close and personal with these razor-toothed killers and see how they track the scent of fear and why their primal urge to hunt is never satisfied. In Lion, you'll watch a lioness teach her cubs the rules of survival. Witness the grace and beauty of the ultimate tacticians in Cheetah and Leopard. Grizzly profiles a majestic beast who fears no animal, no man. And many more titles from an exciting collection of video cassettes, each featuring an in-depth look at nature's wild, how they create life, and how they take it away. Capture Time Warner's Predators of the Wild. Environmentally packaged and collectively priced volumes of pure adrenaline-packed excitement. A rare and memorable collection your whole family will enjoy again and again. Available from Warner Home Video. In Africa, the black and gold skins of the spotted cats have been worn for centuries by tribal chiefs and important warriors. They believed by wearing the skins of the cheetah and leopard, they would inherit some of the qualities of these majestic predators, their strength and cunning, grace and beauty. Tradition carefully regulated the wearing and ownership of these skins, so the number of cats killed was relatively small. Then, in the 1920s, spotted cat skins became glamorous. For the next 30 years, tens of thousands of these cats died in the name of fashion. Finally, after long campaigns by many groups, the trade in these skins is now banned. But the illegal demand is still there. Spotted cats are still losing ground to poachers and to expanding human populations. Both cheetahs and leopards are rare outside the national parks. One place where these two beautiful and very different carnivores can still be seen is here in the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. The Serengeti, with its 5,000 square miles of plains, woodlands, hills, and river valleys, provides a variety of habitats and is home to millions of animals that supply rich pickings for predators like the leopard. At first glance, the leopard and cheetah look similar, but they're very different in build, behavior, and the way they hunt. A 
of the six species of cat in the Serengeti, the biggest and the best known is the lion. All the African cats are thought to have evolved from a common ancestor that was almost certainly small, forest-dwelling, and spotted. As the forests have shrunk, the animals have evolved for life on the open savanna. Some of the cats have lost their forest camouflage, but not entirely. Lions are the color of dry grass, but their bellies and flanks, especially the cubs, are clearly marked with the rosette pattern of a leopard spots, a reminder of their origins in the more forested past. The smallest and least known of the Serengeti cats is the African wildcat, it's the size and color of a domestic tabby and lives on mice and lizards on the open plains. The wildcat, like the lion, has vestigial spotting on its flanks. The other lion-colored cat on the Serengeti is the Karakal. This solitary 25-pound creature with its tasseled, expressive ears also has a spotted underside. Perhaps this is simply to camouflage the expanse of white belly, but it is equally likely that caracals too were once spotted and have adapted their coloration to the more open habitat. Then there are the spotted cats. The serval is of similar size to the caracal, about 20 pounds, but is longer legged and less muscular. It preys on rodents and birds. The serval's most noticeable feature is its huge ears. They swivel and search like radar dishes and can locate a mouse 20 feet away. The two large spotted cats of Africa are both efficient predators, but they have little in common. The leopard, weighing around 120 pounds, is a muscular bruiser, an alley cat that prefers to lurk in the shadows. The cheetah, at around 90 pounds, is slender, almost fragile, and a creature who roams the sunlit plains. The cheetah has a long, heavy-tipped tail that helps to stabilize the animal during its high-speed runs. It has small, uniformly sized spots, a very small head with short, clamp-like jaws and short whiskers. Its long, slender legs end in large, blunt claws that cannot be retracted like a normal cat's. On the inside of the wrist is a sharp dew claw used like a grappling iron. Its very long legs and long flexible spine enable it to sprint for a couple of hundred yards at up to 68 miles an hour, its tail flailing to help balance the turns. Closing on its target, the cheetah trips it with that hooked dew claw. Then, avoiding the sharp hooves, it clamps its jaws onto the animal's throat, sealing its fate. The cheetah's jaws aren't very powerful. They don't break the animal's neck. In fact, they seldom break even the skin. But the exhausted gazelle desperately needs oxygen. The cheetah clamps off its air, and it quickly dies. Even though the cheetah is the fastest animal on four legs, it's surprisingly limited in the range of animals it can kill. Giraffe are obviously too big. 
Birds require as much energy to hunt as larger prey, but provide too little food to make the effort worthwhile. Impala are seldom tackled. They are a bit heavy and tend to stay in cover. Dictic are a small and difficult target as they jink and swerve through the thorny scrub. Baboons live in troops and are dangerous. Some cheetah learn to hunt warthogs, but their risks are high. Warthogs can inflict serious wounds with their long, sharp teeth. Bush hyrax come down from the trees, where they would be catchable, as do vervet monkeys, but the cheetah ignores them, along with many smaller creatures, such as mice or snakes. Heavyweights, like the thousand-pound eland, and the even bigger buffalo, are beyond the cheetah's limits. The leopard, which weighs a little more than a cheetah, preys on all these species, from mice and small birds to the young of buffalo or giraffe. Not only is the cheetah fussy about the type of food it eats, but also about the way it gets it. While the leopard will scavenge a stinking carcass, the cheetah never touches carrion, only eating what it has killed itself. The Serengeti cheetah specializes almost entirely in hunting one species, the Thompson's gazelle, or Tommy. And the distribution of these gazelles is a deciding factor in where the cheetahs live. from November to May, the Tommies move away from the woodlands out onto the open plains, and the female cheetahs follow them. Here they set up overlapping home ranges of up to 300 square miles, which contain all they need to raise their young, cover, shade, and lots of gazelles. Under these ideal conditions, most of the females will conceive. A cheetah will have up to six cubs, which will have a mantle of grayish fur for the first four months of their life. Mortality is high. By three months, 90% of the cubs will die, victims of lions, hyenas, grass fires, or hunger. But because they have such large litters, when conditions are right, a good number of cubs reach maturity. At 18 months old, the surviving cubs leave their mother to lead independent lives. The females go off alone, but the males stay together. Of these cubs, about to set out on their own, three are males. They will stay bonded in a coalition that will last for life. In order to win females, the males have to mark out and hold a territory. A group of males is much more successful than a single animal. On average, two males will hold a territory for up to eight months, whereas three might hang on for two years. Being in a group means having to share females, but because a group will have a better territory and therefore access to more females, the individual's chances of mating are increased. Solitary male cheetahs, who make up about 40% of the male population, are very rarely able to hold a territory. They are usually in poor condition and lead lives of quiet desperation, lying low to avoid large predators, especially other male cheetahs in groups. Like these two, patrolling their boundary. A single male lies down submissively, but it doesn't save him.
Badly wounded in the legs and stomach, this cheetah died 48 hours later, the penalty of being solitary. In comparison, the leopard is a natural loner. Except for mating pairs and mothers with cubs, leopards are always solitary. Its camouflage, originally developed for the forests, is still effective in other habitats because the leopard is a constant seeker of shade. Its spots are the ultimate in disruptive pattern. The cheetah has simple solid spots. The leopard does too, on the lower legs and head. But on the body, these spots coalesce around patches of brown on a pale background. These rosettes perfectly mimic the dappling of light and shade where the leopard spends most of its life. Unlike the cheetah, the leopard's claws are retractable and needle sharp. Also unlike the cheetah, it is stocky and muscular in build, with a powerful neck and head and the long whiskers of a night hunter. It has a much wider range of prey than the cheetah, so can occupy a much wider range of habitat, from desert to rainforest, mountains to coastal swamps. In the Serengeti, the leopard makes little use of the open plains and is found mostly in the woodlands and rocky hills. Being a very efficient predator, it has long idle periods, which it spends in an elevated place where it can watch the surrounding country. Capable of feeding on almost anything and hiding almost anywhere, the leopard is even found on the outskirts of many of Africa's biggest cities. In the forested suburbs of Nairobi, leopards are alive and well. Despite all the chain-link fences, guard dogs, floodlights and night watchmen, leopards move like phantoms through the night, drinking from swimming pools and scavenging from garbage cans. Any pet dog left out for the night is fair game. In a more normal setting, on the edge of the Serengeti Plain, a leopard sets out to stalk a herd of Thompson's gazelle. The mosaic of long grass and patches of bush are perfect conditions for the leopard's technique. It stalks as close as possible and then makes a short, swift charge. Unlike the cheetah, which when it misses, gives up, the leopard keeps its head down, gets back into cover, and keeps moving forward.
always the opportunist and always alone. The rush is explosive, and the kill is made with a deep, powerful bite, which punctures the skull. The cheetah lacks the leopard's muscular strength, and will usually give up rather than risk injury when threatened. Two cheetah hunting together can take on prey which they wouldn't dare tackle alone. Even a warthog family, guarded by adult females, equipped with huge, sharp teeth, can be tackled by a team of three males. By splitting up, two cheetahs distract and confuse the adults' desperate attempts to save their young, allowing the third male to grab an unprotected hoglet. The cats spread confusion in the long grass. Cheetahs mark their territories constantly by leaving dung and urine on prominent landmarks, usually rocks and trees. The leopard does the same and takes sensual delight in rolling in the scent of other leopards. Suburban leopards are attracted to the pungent, cat-like scent of Michaelmas daisies, which triggers the same response. The leopard male walks alone, but for the cheetahs, as we've seen, ganging together in groups makes the males more flexible hunters and enables them to hold on to prime territories. The more there are, the better the territory, and the longer they can hang on to it. The females, which must provide plenty of food as well as shade and shelter for their young, range over huge areas. The males try to stake out a territory where several female ranges overlap, giving them access to as many mates as possible. These males have picked up the scent of a female coming into season, and the hunt is on. The female is nervous, unready for their attention. She tries to hide. Again, the advantages for the males of being in a group are plain. By taking turns, it is easier for two or three of them to trail a female until she comes into estrus. For the next several days, the males will pursue her day and night, growling and swatting her with their paws. For her, courtship appears to be a brutal affair, but in fact this behavior is important to trigger ovulation. 
females in captivity that do not get this rough treatment are less likely to conceive. Finally, she is ready. They will probably all mate with her, but even if only one does, genetically it will have been a success. This is because 80% of these male coalitions are made up of brothers who share 50% of the same genes. Whichever male fertilizes the female, the next generation will inherit the family bloodlines. Compared to cheetahs, a male leopard approaches with caution. When he detects a female coming into oestrus, the male calls to make contact. She is not yet receptive, and she lets him know it. With no way around those teeth, and her rear end tucked firmly into the thorns, the male has no choice but to wait. Patience will be rewarded. Within a few days, she will let him mate. Leopards have fewer cubs than cheetahs, usually two or three. They are born blind and defenseless and when small, they are kept well hidden among rocks or in wooded gullies, only coming out briefly to play when their mother is present to protect them. Small cubs are vulnerable to attack by hyenas and lions, who often kill them. But leopard cubs fare better than young cheetahs because even at an early age, they are skillful climbers. The female is restless, and the cubs sense it. She is about to go off hunting, and she will leave the cubs behind. When she walks away from them in this decisive fashion, they understand they are not meant to follow, and they head back for the safety of a big tree. Out of reach of their enemies, the cubs will be safe here until the female returns. The cheetah's cubs are at far greater risk. They will never be able to climb to safety, and because they live in open country, the available cover is more obvious and is likely to be searched by hunting predators. The cheetah hides her young in dense thickets and is careful to ensure she is not seen or followed when she visits them. She stays with them at night, visiting them only briefly by day to feed them, hoping not to draw attention to their hiding place. But that is exactly what has happened. She has been seen by a couple of lions. If the cheetah simply walked off, the lion would probably do the same. But her concern and tension catch the lion's interest.
It would not bother trying to catch the cheetah, but her nervousness has heightened its curiosity. It seems to sense the reason for her agitation, and when she moves off, the lions start an intensive search among their rocks and scrub. so she dares not check on her cubs in the dark in case the lions are still there. After a restless night, she returns at dawn. The lions have killed three of the cubs. The fourth is missing, almost certainly eaten. The female does not seem to comprehend what has happened, and for a while she carries one of the small bodies around. Finally, the fact of its death appears to sink in, and she drops it. For the rest of the morning, more as an expression of her loss than in hope of finding a survivor, she circles the rocks, calling forlornly. Miraculously, the fourth cub has survived, and against all the odds, its mother has found it. But the cub is still small, and still has a long way to go. Cheetahs can climb, and the cubs climb a lot in play, but they do it poorly. and it is never a way to safety, as it is with the leopard. Cheetahs cannot take refuge in trees with their blunt claws and gangling legs. The leopard, with its hooked claws and compact muscular build, is a natural climber and is perfectly at home in the branches. This climbing ability is significant for the leopard's safety and camouflage, but is also very important to its supreme efficiency as a predator. A large part of the leopard's diet is made up of rodents, birds, and other small creatures. but it is capable of killing much larger prey, even a baby giraffe. A single leopard has been known to kill a full-grown bull eland, weighing over a thousand pounds, and even an adult male gorilla was once killed by a leopard one quarter of his weight. Pound for pound, they are probably the most capable killers in Africa. For an animal that lives alone, the ability to kill such large prey is only an advantage if it can hang on to it. This leopard could, given five or six days, eat all of this gazelle, but it's likely to lose it well before then, either to lions or a pack of hyenas. 
Somehow, it must find a way of keeping it. The solution is a formidable combination of the leopard's great muscular strength and climbing ability. A leopard can easily carry its own weight and more high into the branches, where it will be safe from other predators and scavengers. The leopard can now feed at leisure and will be able to finish the whole carcass. And it's not just an efficient feeder, it is also fastidious. It's the only predator to pluck the hair from its prey before eating. The cheetah can't consume a whole gazelle at a sitting, neither can it carry it up into a tree. The cheetah's strategy is the reverse of the leopard's. If there's cover close by, it will drag the carcass there, but it won't try to hang on to its kill at all. In this case, the mother lets the young feed first, but the cheetah's basic tactic is to eat as much as she can, as fast as she can, concentrating on the large muscle mass, internal organs, and blood. In between bouts of eating, she scans the country for any creature who might steal the kill. Vultures are a big problem for cheetahs. A column of vultures plummeting down to a kill is likely to attract lions or hyenas who will home in and steal it. The arrival of the first vultures usually signals the beginning of the end of the cheetah's meal. cheetah's nerve breaks. A jackal is already attracted. Hyenas are probably on the way. It's time to go. Because the cheetah is so easy to chase away and cannot store food, it has to kill at least twice as often as the similar sized leopard. The cheetah is a competent hunter, but unable to defend its kills. Vulnerable and relatively frail, a cheetah cannot risk fighting over its kill. A bite in a leg or foot could destroy its hunting ability and mean death from starvation. Even for this group of five, defending their kill is simply not worth the risks involved. It is easier and much safer to go and catch another gazelle rather than face the male baboon's fearsome teeth. Baboons are very fond of meat and will hunt and kill newborn gazelles when they can. They are more than a match for the cheetah and they flash their great canines in a mixture of fear and aggression. These baboons are putting on the same show for a leopard. But there's a difference in the essential spirit of these two cats. With odds of only five to two in their favor, the cheetahs gave up. At about 40 to one against, the leopard keeps moving in. Oh, <laughs> 
She is forced to back down, but she's made her point. The baboons move out, and her cubs, hidden among the rocks, are safe once more. With their mother watching over them from above, the cubs can explore. A heavy rainstorm has brought out a terrapin, who's been buried for several months underground to avoid the dry season. The terrapin is very hungry, but it's going to have to wait a little bit longer. It's under no real threat. It smells so bad that the leopard won't eat it, or even play with it for very long. Play is essential to a growing predator. It enables them to practice stalking and pouncing, and to polish the skills they will need for adult life. To help her young develop in this way, a female will often bring them something to chase. She has found a baby Tommy. The mother gazelle watches helplessly. The leopard is entranced with the fawn. She keeps her claws in to avoid damaging it. But she has a problem. The cubs are some distance away. And before she can work out how to move the fawn without hurting it, another player enters the game. A lion has seen the activity and starts to take an interest. The long grass hides the fawn, but the leopard's behavior is strange. Perhaps there's an easy meal to be had. The leopard heads back to the trees. The fawn is shaken, but not scarred. And the lion still hasn't figured out what was going on. The provision of a live prey animal on which the young can practice their hunting skills is essential for a predator's development. So it's no surprise the cheetah does exactly the same thing for her cubs. As did the leopard, the cheetah saw the tommy fawn from a distance as it crouched to hide and has homed in on it. And again, the fawn, too young to recognize a predator, is unconcerned. But the cheetah has her cubs with her, and the moment the fawn runs, they react. Instinct tells them exactly what to do, but they have to practice to get it right. The trip, and a classic cheetah kill, body kept away from the flailing hooves, and the fatal clamp on the throat. At times, they are left to look and learn as mother stalks that day's meal. But usually they tag along, and their inexperience often spoils the hunt.
In the 18 months before they go off on their own, they have much to learn. That lions, leopards, hyenas, and people should be avoided. Where to find water. That some things are inedible and others incredible. That jackals make excellent pacemakers for growing muscles. And that some animals, when you get within tripping distance, are too big to tackle. Life is very difficult for young cheetahs when they first set out on their own, even for a group of several males. Without a good territory, they can starve in the midst of plenty. To survive, they must take any and every opportunity, even in areas where they have no experience and where they are fearful and puzzled by what is happening. Two Grant's gazelle are locked in battle, oblivious to their surroundings. A young cheetah runs in, but slows down, filled with apprehension. It cannot understand why the gazelles are failing to run away. Nothing in their experience has prepared them for this. How can they trip an animal that won't run? As soon as the gazelle makes a move, the cheetah's predatory instinct and training is brought into play. The gazelle is too powerful to trip, is twice the weight of each cheetah, and its horns are lethal weapons. But the youngsters are desperately hungry, and in their inexperience will take desperate risks. A young leopard tentatively marks out a new territory for itself. In its own secretive, hidden way, it will have been through similar hardships to the cheetahs. Apart from the trials of growing up, which is common to all predators, the leopard and the cheetah have few similarities. The sociable cheetah is as bright and open as the plains where it lives. The leopard is a lonesome creature of mystery and darkness. different social systems, behavior, hunting techniques, and lifestyles, the leopard and the cheetah have almost nothing in common except their dappled beauty. For too long, these magnificent cats and their striped and spotted cousins on other continents have been slaughtered simply because they are so beautiful. In the past, the warrior who wore a spotted cat skin thought he could take on that animal's strength and cunning and the woman who wore one hoped to acquire some of the cat's grace and splendor. Today, these myths are fading into the past, 
as people realize that nothing can compare with the sheer power and beauty of the cheetah and leopard. Over a hundred years ago, Gerald Manley Hopkins wrote a famous poem, Pied Beauty, that celebrated all things spotted and speckled. He spoke of stippled trout and finch's wings. Perhaps he never saw a cheetah or a leopard, for they would surely feature in a poem that begins, Glory be to God for dappled things.